Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry we're a little late. All of our meetings have been running behind schedule. We have several meetings throughout the day. They're all running behind. We are running. We are probably out of breath. Anyhow, <clears throat> um, thank you for being with us. Uh, to those of you in person, to those live streaming, um, and now I will ask our board secretary to take a roll call. Thank you. President Craighead? Here. Member Benitez? Present. Uh, Member Miller? Here. Member Otto? Here. And we have a quorum. Thank you. Um, Mr. Miller, will you lead us in a pledge? Absolutely. Right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. For those of you present in the room, the board appreciates and supports community input at our meetings. During the meeting, there will be time for the public to comment on matters on the agenda and matters not on the agenda. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have provided forms in the back of the room and also have additional copies by our board secretary. Um, if you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's agenda, and there were no reportable actions taken. Um, we are now at adoption of the agenda. I move to approve. Second. Uh, any discussion? Um, all in favor? Should we have? No, we don't. We don't have to do that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, that's four zero. I'm just trying to reconcile both of these. Oh, okay. So now we're at the fun part for this evening. And we have been interviewing students for our student board member position. Uh, Dr. Baker and myself interviewed six, no, yes. Oh my gosh, it's been a long day. Six students we had the pleasure of sitting down with some of our brightest most fabulous students honestly and i'm recognizing some students in the audience now so one by one we're going to ask you to come to the podium we're going to say some things about you and after we're introducing everyone uh this evening we'll do a, a picture and we will take it from there, from there. And each of the board members and Dr. Baker will have an opportunity to introduce these fabulous students, honestly. So I'm going to start out, and I'm going to invite Sophia Gibson uh, to the podium. Sophia, what a pleasure to meet you and get to talk to you. I'm going to refer to my notes and just mention some of your um, activities and accolades. Um, let's see, ASB Secretary of Girls Athletics, uh, ASB Secretary for um, the fall semester, so this semester. Yes. You are passionate about making positive changes. Um, where you feel they're needed. And for example, the beach volleyball team at Lakewood was not being covered by the 562. And here's something that I really appreciated that you did. You saw that the girls volleyball was not being covered. And so you scouted the reporter at a boys sport event. Yes. And you had a conversation with him about that inequity, and you were able to convince him to cover girls' volleyball. So advocating not just for yourself, but for um, you know, girls' sports, volleyball, 
very successfully, I might add. You were very successful in that. Um, let's see. You are a part of the healthcare analysis class, which was one of your favorites. And now you are an American Red Cross certified lifeguard and water safety instructor. And that's all thanks to your introduction um, to what being a first responder is like and how to properly take care of others' lives. So you're a very caring person and you've done a lot of different things um, to help your community, all while maintaining a 4.0 grade point average at Lakewood High. And uh, you, you will be taking four AP classes this coming, is that, is that true? A little bit in the works. Um, it's three right now, but there's three. so much changing with the schedules right now. I'm not even sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully four. Okay, well, would you like to um, introduce somebody who's come with you tonight? Um, yes, I have my mom, my godmom, my grandmother, and my dad. Wonderful, okay, let's give you a Okay, so we will next invite, I'm sorry, what? Oh, we have a recognition for you. Um, I have your recognition. I knew that. <laughs> Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Yeah. Okay, thank goodness we have um, James to keep us on track uh, because as you can tell, we did not rehearse this part. So next, um, let's see. Uh oh, I don't have the list of who's in. in uh, uh, I do have the list. It's behind this paper. Um, Mr. Otto. is a senior at Sato uh, High School. He's involved in student, student government where he was the ASB vice president and on the principal's advisory committee. He uh, is considered to be constructively uh, uh, great at constructively expressing his opinions and is a great problem solver. Um, he has a GPA of 4.2 in his junior year and a 4.0 overall. Uh, he is taking two AP uh, his, uh, classes, U.S. History and Language and Composition, and he's in two honors classes, Pre-Calculus and Chemistry, both as a junior. Um, uh, his friends and others consider him well-rounded, humorous, charismatic, and empathetic. He enjoys playing basketball and going go-kart racing. Um, and uh, we are delighted to uh, have him uh, apply for this position, and we'll see how, how this all works out. So, thank you. Pardon? Oh, yeah. Um, hello. Uh, people that came with me is my dad and my mom. Great. And we have a um, recognition for you um, that I'm happy to hand to you. Congratulations for all your hard work. I would just like to add that our interview took place on Zoom because he was out of the country. He was in Iceland. That was interesting. Okay, um, Dr. Benitez. Yes, it's my honor to introduce Faith Anderson. Hey. I will also share some excerpts from um, the application that Faith uh, submitted. So Faith is the treasurer of the Sato Ambassadors, um, also the president of the Society of Women Engineers, uh, also captain and coach of the softball uh, team, and a link crew. 
uh, member. A couple of the things that stood out uh, for me is um, your passion for meeting new people, encouraging them to do new things, things, and teaching them how to be the best version uh, of themselves. That's really important um, for all of us. Uh, favorite classes right now are AP United States History. I'm a history uh, major, so love that you love history and learning the life lessons from the past uh, from a teacher that faith aspires to be in the future. Uh, so it makes that class rise above others. Um, and your tenacious mentality that cannot deter you from anything that you set your mind to and to those goals and being a valuable team member. So uh, Faith, please come up here and receive your certificate uh, as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there anyone in the audience that uh, you'd like to uh, yeah. introduce? Um, my parents are here and my siblings are here as well. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, um, Dr. Baker. Yes, is Angelina here? There's Angelina, great, we're so glad you came in. Hi Angelina, so it is my pleasure to introduce Angelina and say a few things about her and what she shared in her application. So Angelina is a senior at Millican High School, has been involved as a Quest Rambassador has been involved with youth leadership Long Beach, Girl Scouts, Long Beach Search and Rescue, founder of Rams Without Limits at Millican High School. The after school program was made available to any student with special needs as well as neurotypical volunteers, a new program which was very exciting to hear about. A few of the things that Angelina shared in her application is if she were selected as the student board member, she will continue to demonstrate the ability to listen to different viewpoints, res respect diverse perspectives, and work collaboratively with others. She said, I understand that student board members often have to balance their academic responsibilities with their board commitments. I believe I have the ability to manage time effectively and handle multiple tasks simultaneously. And we know you can. She is known for facilitating group discussions, listening, acknowledging tension, and getting curious about what is happening. That, ha and that has increased her ability to ask relevant questions about whether an action she is considering has the potential to perpetuate, and these are her words, undesirable aspects of outdated systems and or to be transformative. I believe that when you decide to lead, your commitment extends beyond your self-interest. All of this, she has maintained a 4.0 GPA for the past three years at Millican, and she says, I'm in a rigorous academic pathway. I've taken many AP classes, as well as taken courses at LBCC, and appreciates the opportunity to participate in dual enrollment. We're so glad you're here. Congratulations so much for, for hosting this. <laughs> oh, Who do you have see? with you tonight? I am here with my mom and my abuelita. I love you guys, my girls, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Okay. Ms. Lopez. It is my honor to highlight some excerpts from the application of student board member finalist Axel Aguilar. Um, Axel, please come to the podium. So Axel is a first generation Latino student who, uh, Latino student from Long, Be um, from Long Beach, Jordan, hi. And um, here's some highlights from his application. He is currently serving as the president of the Tender Loving uh, Care Club. He is the president of the Aspirations and Medical Sciences Club and has been served as vice president of Omega Brothers, vice president of Link Learning Students Pathway Ambassador, He's uh, involved with Health Occupation Students of America. He's the secretary there. 
and he's the editor-in-chief for the Jordan High School Yearbook. Um, Axel is on track to be the valedictorian of his high school and uh, is currently uh, enrolled in, uh, has a dual enrollment, enrollment classes. And he says he's proactive in organizing team meetings, delegating tasks, and ensuring that everyone is on track with their responsibilities. Axel says that he leads by example and has uh, led his, one of his teams to win, win first place uh, who, and this team produced a high quality project, again, that led them to first place. So congratulations um, to you, Axel. Um, who's here with you? Uh, unfortunately, my family wasn't able to attend, but my principal, Miss Irving, was able to attend oh. as support. <laughs> And you have the entire LBUSD family here for you, Axel. And please come forward to receive your certificate. Un momento. Hold on. Yes, well, it is my honor to introduce Natalie Canales. Let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Natalie is a senior at Poly High School. And from a student government perspective, she's held office in the Key Club as a secretary and executive assistant. In Model UN, she was the vice president and secretary general. And in the Pace Club, she was the president. In her own words, she said, she finds it essential that students get a say, or at least a voice, in matters that directly affect them. Uh, she currently has maintained, listen to this, a 4.0 GPA and a 4.8 weighted GPA. Yeah, I could have never done that, that's for sure. <laughs> um, uh, with that said, uh, she and I worked together for at least, I don't know, 60, 70 seconds talking about our pr presentation today. So we're going to do a whole dance recital. No, I'm kidding. Um, but all things considered, Natalie, who's with you here tonight? I'm here with my mom and my dad. Oh. <laughs> Natalie, please come up to the dais and receive your certificate of recognition. And then James, should we have everybody else come up and we'll do a picture? So let's have all our student uh, board member applicants come up. Well, thank you so much for being here, and um, 
And I'll tell you, I just, I just wish we all had time to spend with each and every one of these students. Sure, I mean, all their numbers and everything are impressive, all the activities, the, you know, extracurricular stuff, the curricular stuff, all of it, so impressive. But honestly, just to sit down with each and every one of you, um, what a treat, really. So, let's see, we have to move on because we have so much business to take care of. And our next order of business is also fun. So I would like to <coughs> invite Cindy Young to the podium. Um, what, what I don't want to do is um, see her leave the district, but I don't know. She's put in 39 years, so I guess we have to. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, I'm just going to say that uh, I, we have a few words. Um, you are, as you know, retiring as the senior director of the Child Development Centers. We are praising you tonight for leading innovative approaches throughout your career and being a tremendous, a tremendous asset to thousands of students, teachers, and staff in your many roles as a teacher, principal, and leader serving for many years as the director of the Child Development Centers and implementing high quality TK and kindergarten programs, as well as expanded enrichment and childcare opportunities for students and families. And consistently looking for ways to support others and bring additional funding into our district to improve learning environments and outcomes for students. And I know that at the end of the 22-23 uh, school year, you secured a donation from Lakeshore Learning in the amount of $20,000. And they did that because of the relationship that you had established with them. That was a lot on your part, and you did that um, on behalf of the district. So thank you so much. So please accept this certificate um, as a, a token of our appreciation for your 39 years worth of service to Long Beach Unified and for the lasting contributions that you have made to thousands of students. Thank you so much. So I'll have you come up, shake our hands, and then um, turn is yours. Before I start, what I'd like to say is we doubled that 20, so we got the 20, and we've secured an additional 20 for the next year. <laughs> Thank you all, and good evening. I'd like to take a moment to introduce my family. My husband, Scott, is here. My daughter, Skye. My son, Aaron, and his wife, Tam, are watching live from Fallbrook. My daughter, Haley, and her husband, Taylor and my parents, Judy and Lou, are watching live from Nevada. I want to thank them all for being incredibly supportive and understanding over the years. Honestly, I couldn't have done it without them. My retirement is bittersweet. It's hard to believe I've worked for 39 years for Long Beach Unified. Time really does fly when you're having fun. I can honestly say I've loved every position I've had over the years and found tremendous joy in that journey. 
Each position brought new learning opportunities, challenges, and sometimes long, stressful days. As I reflect on my career, I can't help, think, help but think about the people, my colleagues and good friends, some who have joined me tonight, and thank you, as well as the children and families we serve. Over the last couple of years, I've thought a lot about my legacy. For some, their legacy might be about programs, changes, or innovations they've led. I'm grateful for having had so many amazing opportunities over the years to elevate program quality as well as being given the autonomy to think outside the box. But instead of programs, I hope my legacy is the people. The incredible people I've worked alongside over the years as colleagues, friends, family and community partners, <clears throat> and the important work they will continue to do. My wish for all of them is joy and success in their journey. <clears throat> I am honored to have worked with all of you and look forward to watching Long Beach Unified continue to be the leader in innovation, dedicated people, and student success. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I think at this time we'll uh, watch a video and we have something, a celebration. Female Leadership Academy is a community, not only here on campus, but within our gender identity. Um, I know specifically here on Lakewood, it gives us a chance to educate one another. We talk about struggles and what we go through and it's nice to know that you have people around you knowing that you can talk to them. Being here not only do you get the friendships that you do and you learn, you get to have this power to be yourself. The skills that I've learned in FLA really taught me about responsibility and organization. Just daily skills like leadership, organization, time management are really important that I'm using today that I'm definitely going to use in my future. Oftentimes students really feel alone, but we want to make sure that everyone knows that you are never alone. There's always someone who cares about you and someone who's there to love you and support you. And we really want to push that idea that we are a safe place for someone to come and talk about anything. Being in the FLA has made me such a better person. It's made me understand what being a woman is like and what it's supposed to be. I've been able to connect with people who have also experienced things that I've also experienced and I didn't think that would really happen at first but being able to know that I have a safe space, I have other people who can be there for me and just feel like I'm welcomed and protected is something that I feel like everyone should experience. If you have the opportunity to join FLA, take it. FLA is more than just a club, it's really just become a, a family. Okay, before we move on with the agenda, I'm gonna go back to item number seven. Um, the part about where the board was meeting in closed session. Because there was actually an action we took, but like I said, we're all running behind and our meetings were running over. So let me read uh, what the board <laughs> did in closed session. So, um, in closed session today, uh, we took action on item 3.1, Confidential Student Matters, pursuant to California Education Code section 35146. The board voted 4-0 with Ms. Lopez abstaining to lift the expulsion of student ID number 4189, and the board voted 5-0 to lift the expulsion of student ID number 2794. Both students will be assigned to a school or instructional program as recommended by the Office of Student Placement Services. Thank you. Um, and before we go on um, for our retiree and any of our student uh, board member applicants, if you'd like to go and celebrate or um, enjoy the rest of your evening, 
feel free to go, or you can stay with us um, in the meeting. That's up to you. But thank you very much for being here and for letting us acknowledge you. And can I just say, good job, parents. Good job. Okay, so we are at public testimony. Yeah, President, we have nope. Okay, so let's just take a moment. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, we'll just we'll just take a moment. Okay, it looks like um, most everybody has found a seat. That's good. Um, it's now time for public comment. We want to allow members of the public to make comments. So let's see. For items not listed on the agenda, am I doing that right? Yeah. Or no, listed. I should do that first. Why is that not here? For items listed on the agenda, we have Dr. Kim Tabari. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Baker, Deputy Superintendent Brown, and staff. I am providing comments on agenda item 12.7, approval of purchasing and contracts report. <clears throat> I'm a parent serving on the Long Beach Education Connection, a coalition of parents, guardians, community-based and advocacy-based organizations working on budget and policy system-wide changes to improve the school for, to improve school for students across the district. I am also a member of the district's Black Student Achievement Initiative Committee. Many parents could not get here early enough to make public comments. I'm speaking on behalf of some of them as well. We are looking for transparency and accountability on a few items pertaining to academic support that LBUSD has committed to for this 23-24 school year, specifically items 44, 63, and 81 um, on that agenda item. The contract item for number 44 with Khan Academy, which is approximately $366,000 to provide online subscription-based programs for students, also, the contract with Princeton Review, item 63, approximately $230,000 to provide online math tutoring to select students. And your contract with the Stepping Stone Group, which is item 81 in that, item, in that agenda item, approximately $4 million to provide specified, specialized academic staffing support to special ed students. A lot of money here, right? So I want to thank the staff, first and foremost, that made these a priority and administered all of these contracts. And myself and other community members are really curious as to what the implementation plan looks like throughout the district. As I said, this is a lot of money, so how, how are we making sure that we're using it well? How will teachers and students in different schools be held accountable for working with tutors? How will select students be identified for math tutoring to the Princeton contract? Will there be incentives in place as a kickoff to encourage or engage students? How will these systems be tracked and monitored for success? 
So in closing, board members, please exercise your power and leadership to truly make this a successful year for students, especially black and Pacific Islander students who are the most in need of academic support. Demand accountability across the district, ask questions and demand answers. To the families listening online and in the gallery, there are 15 pages of contracts that the district is approving today for various programs at your child's school. I know there's a significant amount of harm and trauma from some of our experiences that our children has faced. However, the district cannot do this without us. I urge you to get involved at your child's school, ask questions, talk to teachers, principals, staff. These are our tax dollars at work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have no other uh, speakers for items listed on the agenda. So we will go to public testimony on items not listed on the agenda. We have quite a list. Um, comments on an item not listed for discussion today must be about issues that are within the jurisdiction of the board. Please note that due to California law, we the board cannot enter into a discussion on any items not listed on the agenda. Uh, board members or staff may ask clarifying questions or provide clarification regarding public comments, but such discussion is limited. Each speaker will be provided up to three minutes, and we will spend a total of 30 minutes on items not listed on the agenda, which is gonna to be tough because we have uh, 11 people who wanna speak, so if everybody could be quick, I think we we'll, might be able to fit everybody in. So first up, we have Mackenzie Matthew. Hello, my name is Mackenzie Matthew and I'm here to comment on the unacceptable conditions and lack of available restrooms at Poly High School. I'd like to start with a quick story. In April of last school year, my first class was AP US, has, AP US government, which was in the bungalows. And if you look at this map of my school, it's way in the corner. I loved that class and wanted to be there for as much of lecture as possible, but I also had started my period the day before. Knowing I would need to go to the restroom before the class concluded, I waited until we had a break and hustled towards the restroom next to the book room, right here. When I arrived, that restroom was locked. I tried the restroom in the 100 building, right here in our school campus, which was also locked. I tried the bathroom that's connected to our library, right here, and I'm sure you can see where this is going. It was also locked. By the time I found a bathroom that I could even go into, let alone the situation within the bathroom, I was in the 300 building on the exact opposite corner of campus. I tell you this story to make clear that while the LBUSD website claims a reputation of excellence, students cannot learn and thrive if they must miss over 20 minutes of class just to meet their biological needs. Excellence cannot be achieved when we are more worried about our bladder than our schoolwork. When I have raised questions to administrators at my school of why our restrooms are closed, they blame it on vandalism and a few students hiding to get out of class. My ask of the district and you today is to find a way to control the actions of this minority of students in ways that do not infringe on my right to learn. Locking the bathrooms cannot be the only way our skilled administrators can think of to prevent them from being destroyed. I am commonly told when raising these concerns that I should go to the restroom before class and during breaks, but as someone with a period, sometimes I don't have the luxury of waiting these hour and a half long classes before going to the restroom. And even if I could, the restrooms are locked on breaks as well. So when I got back to class that day after my journey to the restroom, I had missed a fundamental section of the lecture. And I know every day I go to the restroom, I have to decide between my health and my education. As a young person, I should not have to make that decision. That is not something that is dependent on me. That is something that the adults in my life should be able to help me with. The lack of accessible restrooms at my school keep me from getting the most out of an education I am extremely grateful for. Please help me and my peers have the opportunity to learn so we can continue to make ourselves, LBUSD and Polly proud. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, next up, we have Olivia. Hello, everyone. My name is Olivia Seard, and I'm here to comment on the unacceptable conditions and lack of available restrooms at Poly High School. This is my soap dispenser, and this is my roll of toilet paper. I bring these to school each day because I can't rely on them being in any of the bathrooms at school. More times than I can count, I have found empty dispensers and commiserated with my classmates, coughing from the pink vapor coming from around the corner. Being a scholar and champion, Polly's motto and promise, should not mean that I need to bring my own soap to school. At Polly, going to the restroom is an ordeal, requiring planning and encompassing difficulty, and students are suffering. Let's begin with the conditions of the bathrooms themselves. The moment I enter a restroom at school, I have to prioritize a bathroom stop over my lungs. I have to battle secondhand smoke from vape cartridges that is sometimes almost unbearable. I have to mask in my backpack so that I can breathe while I'm waiting in line. I often visualize a disease crawling in my lungs, and I wonder how the vapor will affect my athlete and asthmatic friends. The stalls create some relief from the vapor, but they create their own challenges. Entering a bathroom can be a degrading experience where I face racial slurs and jeers written on the walls of the stalls. Toilet seats and handles frequently are broken, and stall doors don't always lock, assuming, of course, that the stall door is actually attached to the stall still. And much of the time, sometimes for days on end, there might be no toilet paper in the dispenser. But the worst feeling is when I discover that there is, once again, no soap. It's come to the point where I am surprised when there is soap in the restroom, and this is a critical problem. We've just come back from a pandemic, but besides that, bacteria can cause everything from colds to gastrointestinal is illnesses, and they can spread easily in schools. I have to ask myself if the computer I'm writing an essay on will keep me home because the person who used it before me didn't have access to soap, and even if they did, were they able to rinse in a broken sink? What we need is not lessons on how to hold our breath around vapor or how to pack soap and toilet paper. We need more dispensers that can only be opened by staff. We need cameras outside of bathrooms and monitoring by ASB or admin. We need to move the mirrors away from the sinks to reduce congestion. I love my school and I'm so glad I came to LBUSD. I just wish I knew that my dignity and health meant as much the district as my test scores. Please, we just want to be able to use a restroom that any of the adults here would be comfortable using. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have James Carroll. James. Hello. My name is James Carroll. I am a junior at Long Beach Poly, and I'm here to speak about the unacceptable conditions and lack of available restrooms. At Poly, we, ha should, we should have multiple restrooms for everybody. However, restrooms on campus are being closed for supposed maintenance reasons. If restrooms do happen to be open, many restrooms will have destroyed urinals, destroyed toilets, damaged or inoperable stalls, graffiti, followed by the concurrent absence of to paper towels, soap, and even toilet paper at times. One shouldn't have to walk halfway across campus after checking up to three restrooms to find one that is operable. These conditions and experiences are shared by many students of all pathways and grades at the campus. We ask you to please address these problems because us students, parents, and faculty are tired of these deplorable conditions occurring on our campus. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jack Park. Oh, yeah. Hello, my name is Jack Park, and I'm here to comment on the unacceptable conditions and lack of available restrooms at Poly High School. I'm a junior here at Poly, and for the longest time, I've tried my best not to use the restroom. There are many different reasons for this. The restrooms carry a large stench that doesn't smell like your normal restroom. It reeks of weed, vape, and smoke. The restrooms are also constantly littered with trash that are clogging up sinks, toilets, urinals, and causing overflowing and mess. 
This makes the bathroom experience very uncomfortable and unpleasant for me and for others as well. However, the one thing that is the biggest issue that needs to be addressed at Long Beach Poly is to have more restrooms in general. Poly High School is the largest public school in Long Beach with 4,000 students coming in and out of the school every day. However, even with this massive student population, there are around four different restrooms for each gender, with two of them being broken probably every day. Let's see. When I was a freshman at Poly, I had to really use the restroom due to stomach problems. So I asked my teacher to be excused and left the classroom with a pass and 10 minutes to do my business. With 10 minutes on the clock, I went to one near the library. However, it was closed due to maintenance problems of over flooding. I walked near to the restroom in the 100 building, but was filled with kids vaping, smoking, and taking up the entire restroom for themselves. I had to finally resort to the music room restroom, which at the time was not filled with soap, toilet paper, or paper towels. Luckily, I knew about this problem, and I brought my own toilet paper. But like many other students who didn't bring the toilet paper, it would not be a good day for them, and they could not have used a restroom without having problems like this. Just closing restrooms for maintenance is not a viable solution and is something that I feel disgusted about. I feel like the district should really address this bathroom issue as is making the quality of life for students and teachers to only be harder than what it has to be. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I would also like to show you um, basically what the restrooms look like. Here we can tell that basically everything here is empty. No toilet paper, there's over flooding in the uh, trash cans, and then there's no paper towels. We can't really use the restrooms with these conditions, and um, this is something that we need to talk about and is something that needs to be addressed at Long Beach Poly. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, next, we have Greg West. Greg? Greg? Looking for my full name. My name is Greg West, and I'm here because I strongly disagree with the gender policies being implemented in the Long Beach School District. Good morals, telling the truth, and avoiding lies. These are all things we want to teach our kids. The State of California Education Code states that teachers shall impress upon the minds of the pupils the principles of morality, truth, and to avoid falsehood. Unfortunately, the Long Beach School District doesn't practice it. The district has a transgender guide that says students don't need to inform parents that they're going to make changes related to their gender. It tells your children that they can seek help from school teachers and counselors to change their names and pronouns. They can use the bathrooms and locker rooms of the opposite sex and get counseling for gender transitioning, all without permission or even knowledge of the parents. So much for teaching kids about morality, truthfulness, and avoiding lying. Have you heard about the names of Chloe Cole or Alicia Conan? Google their names. There are two girls in California that went down the path of gender transitioning while in their schools, and later they realized that they made huge mistakes, and now they're paying for it mentally and physically. In England, a decision was recently made to close the world's largest pediatric gender clinic named Tavistock. The Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine said an independent review condemned the clinic as not a safe or viable long-term option because its interventions are based on poor evidence and its model of care leaves young people at considerable risk of poor mental health. I wish I had time to read you an article in the New York Post, June 28, 2023, written by Bethany Mandel titled, New Study on the Rise in Transgenderism Shows It's a Fad, Especially Among Young Girls. You're an educated group of people. You know that the research shows that the brain is not fully developed until the early to mid-20s. This is a fact. This is why teenagers are prone to make risky decisions, also a fact. Do you think a child in elementary school junior high or even high school has a maturity to make a decision about gender transitioning? Everything I'm saying is common sense. In conclusion, I'm concerned about how these policies will impact the physical, emotional, and transgender safety of children. So I strongly urge you to change your policies on gender. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you. Next, we have Sunita Touch. Sunita Touch. Good evening. My name is Sunita. I strongly disagree with the gender policies being implemented in this district. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, the lead federal agency for research on mental disorders, and I quote, the brain finishes developing and maturing in the mid to late 20s. The part of the brain behind the forehead, called the prefrontal cortex, is one of the last parts to mature. This area is responsible for skills like planning, prioritizing, and making good decisions. Changes to the areas of the brain responsible for social processes can lead teens to focus more on peer relationships and social experiences. The emphasis on peer relationships along with ongoing prefrontal cortex development might lead teens to take more risks because the social benefits outweigh the possible consequence of a decision." End quote. This should be a wake-up call for this school district that is letting children make life-altering decisions about their gender. I'm very concerned about how these policies will impact the physical, emotional, and psychological safety of our children. I strongly urge you to change your policies on gender. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Eric. Hello, my name is Eric Jensen, and I have three going on four children in your school system. I highly disagree with the gender policies that are being implemented. Let's look at some of the things of how California views a minor and their decision making. 16 to drive, 18 to smoke, join the military, get a tattoo, piercing, lottery, change your name, open a bank account, or even vote. 21 to drink alcohol. Anyone under 18 cannot give consent to sexual activity, but yet you guys think it's okay to push a sexuality-driven concept to children from five years and up. That is child grooming. And reading about little boys liking other little boys and little girls liking other little girls, that is a form of child pornography. In the United States, it's a federal offense to use the mail, interstate commerce, etc., to entice a minor to sexual activity for which any person can be charged with a criminal offense. These policies, flags, and colors around the schools and classroom are also representative of a gang. And in your student handbook, school policies, it states no gang signs, symbols, colors, or apparel allowed in school. Under California Penal Code, a criminal street gang is defined as an ongoing organization of three or more persons with a common name, identifying mark, or symbol, having as one of its primary activities the commission of a certain crimes, whose members individually or collectively engage in criminal activity, like I addressed before with child grooming and child pornography. You claim the policies are to make the LGBTQ plus community feel accepted and safe, but here are some examples of how wrong they can go. If a girl who identifies as a male were to change in a men's locker room, full of testosterone-filled teenage boys. Do you really think that she would be stared at less or bullied less than in a female locker room where girls are already having a difficult time in the changing of their bodies? Or if a parent who is completely against the idea of a child being transgender or switching names or sex, what happens if the parents find out that they're going by another name at school? Does that not put the child in more danger at home? Does that not put the teacher in danger or other school personnel in a dangerous position if the parent has a violent history? This behavior is promoting manipulation, lies, breaking the law, or having no respect for it by changing unofficial documents and not unofficial ones. I'd like to end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Matthew. Hello, my name is Matthew Ansel. I never thought I'd be speaking here in all my life <laughs> on this issue, but I'm happy to on the behalf of my two children in this school district and I strongly disagree with the gender policies being implemented in our district. I'm concerned about the physical, emotional, and psychological safety of my children being forced to use bathrooms and locker rooms with children of the opposite sex. Our kids are supposed to trust the teachers, coaches, counselors, and principals, the people in authority, people in power, but they're being put in a dangerous and embarrassing situation and telling them to deal with it. And you're also encouraging children to lie to their parents, and that's crazy and wrong. And so I strongly urge you to change your policies on gender. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Sabina West.
Hello, my name is Sabine and I am here because I strongly disagree with the gender policies being implemented in this school district. If you agree with this policy, you are essentially saying that you are comfortable and trust that all teachers will give guidance that aligns with the way that you intend to raise your kids. If a student comes to a teacher and tells them that they would like to change their name and gender, with the current policy in place allowing teachers the right to keep child's decisions a secret from their parents, the teacher might do one of two things. They might encourage the student to change their name and become whichever gender they choose, or they might even they might do the opposite and discourage the child from making the decision at su such a young age. And as a parent, you would be left completely in the dark as to what guidance your kid is actually getting while at school. And what point would this, at what point would the school decide to bring you into this important conversation? LGBTQ students have a much higher chance of getting bullied. So when your student has been confiding in their teacher and decides that they want to change their gender or start using a different restroom and starts to get bullied for it, at what point would the school alert you of this? Would it be months after your child has been getting bullied, dealt with depression, and had suicidal thoughts? Psychology Today says that keeping secrets can trigger depression, anxiety, and poor overall personal health. Our students shouldn't have to go through this confusing season alone. We shouldn't have to wait till our students get bullied before we are finally brought into the conversation. They should be encouraged to have these conversations with the people who know them and love them best, their parents. I don't have kids, but I did go to public school growing up, and I had a super awesome experience. My teachers had great communication with my parents, and it felt like a super safe environment. But it's policies like this that would make me really nervous to put my future kids in the public school system. There are so many families that can't afford to send their kids to private school, and it's policies like this that are pushing so many low-income families out of California. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Hillary. Hello, my name is Hillary Ansel. I have two going on three children in your district, and I'm here to speak up for them, their future, and how I strongly disagree with your gender policies being implemented in this district. Recent studies have shown a dramatic increase in detransition rate. An article in the Dallas Morning News discussed in 2021 report from the U University of Toronto that followed up with a group of people who experienced gender dysphoria in their childhood. 13 years, years after their initial diagnosis, 87.8 of them were classified as a desister. And a desister is someone who was previously identified as a transgender, but would re-identify as their biological sex later on. 87.8 of them change their mind. So you ask why we're here, why we're concerned for our kids, for their future. We love our kids more than you. And we are not willing to let you, the school district, determine their lives, their future, their physical, their medical well-being. Your goal should be education. Our goal is parenting, not gender transformation. So it's time to, for you, Long Beach Unified School District, to step up, rethink your gender policies, and stop supporting gender transitioning. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Harold. Harold. Good evening, everyone. Well, I had something else I was going to say, but somebody else already said it. In fact, you heard about Chloe and what happened with her, and you've heard about how the kids are developing and how this impacts them when it comes to transgender policies, which is something I obviously oppose. And I strongly oppose it because of clearly the consequences. Let's take, for example, the masking. The masking that was imposed on our children had a traumatic psychological effect that was reported first in Germany and then throughout the world with studies stating that they suffered because of the imposition of that policy. This policy that's currently in place where we're instructing our children on how they think of themselves is having a dramatic effect on this generation. They're going to suffer because it is imposed on them against the will of the parents. There's a, there's a show here that I see, Gender Transformation, The Untold Realities. This talks about what happens to some of these kids that have gone through what she just shared, where they transition to a different sex and they regret it because they realize it was a big mistake, but they were railroaded. Why? Because the doctors make millions. One child 
can, uh, can earn them about a million bucks in services to do this transgender change. Really. So we're doing it for the doctor's sake, not for the children's sake. The board needs to do the research and recognize that the consequences to our children are long lasting and could have definite consequences to the board. For example, there was a school that was forced to pay $100,000 for a secret transgender conversion. Now, a secret transgender conversion. The woman and her child won this award, setting a precedence, which means that future parents are going to be able to take serious action against this, against school boards across the country, because a precedence was set. This board will suffer the consequence of their action by not adhering to the desires of the public in Long Beach. In Long Beach. These people are asking for you to listen to them, to listen to their desires because you were voted in to serve them, not for them to serve you. And in closing, Palm Springs uh, was caught. There was a leaked audio, and I'm going to read what it says here. According to Murphy, the conference in Palm Springs appeared to include teachers showing other teachers how to undermine the authority of parents and school administrators and conceal activities related to gender inclusion and sexual orientation from them. I pray and I hope that this would not be supported or enacted by anyone in the school district of Long Beach because that $100,000 lawsuit can grow exponentially when parents realize that their words, their thoughts are not being heard. I really hope you'll change your policy with regard to this and I thank you for your time. Good night. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have consent calendar A. Consent calendar groups the approval of routine agenda items into one action for efficiency and to allow the board to focus our meetings more on student outcomes and other key issues of the district. Um, do any of the board members have questions on consent calendar A? Ms. Lopez? I do. On um, item 12.6, approval of business department report. Number 19, uh, we're asking to provide program support services for CSULB and LBUSD Math Collaborative for selected district students and their parents. So my question is, how are students going to be selected? And then on items number 44 and 63, it's the same question. How are we selecting students? Um, who would like to address those questions on how students are so selected? So number 19 actually is a contract that relates to the employment of the leader of the math collaborative, Doris Robinson. Those students are selected at Jordan High School by Doris Robinson and the team that leads the math collaborative. It's a very specialized group. It is all African-American, black, male students that participate in that version of the math collaborative. Thank you. And um, 4463, the other programs, how are students going to be selected? Yeah, I can address that question. These are two new contracts that are coming forward. Um, which two new ones that we'll address really our intervention programs moving forward. So you'll see some additional contracts coming up in our next board meeting and probably the following as well. These two contracts specifically address math intervention at the secondary level. So the Khan Academy math intervention is available to all students in our middle school math courses. So this would include math six, math six accelerated, math seven, math seven accelerated, math eight and algebra as well as high school courses, Algebra, Geometry, and Algebra II. It is available to all students in those courses. Uh, Khan Academy has been fully integrated into our math curriculum by our math office so that there are lessons integrated into each of their teaching lessons. It provides an additional teaching resource as well as small group resource, an opportunity for reteaching for students, and then obviously targeted intervention lessons based on their pretests within Khan Academy. The second contract is for tutor.com, and this contract is for our secondary students as well in algebra, geometry, and algebra two. 
It is for high dosage online tutoring. It is a live online platform for students to receive 24 seven support, tutoring support. During class, after class, at home, they have access to a live tutor to reteach any content that they are struggling with. Um, so this allows for really math experts to be able to support students in math content. Uh, and that is available for all students in those courses as well. And that's unlimited access throughout the entire year. Okay, do we have any, yes, Dr. Benitez. Just a quick question on item 12.7. Uh, Dr. Baker, can you and or um, one of our executive staff speak to our Title I uh, school-wide program waivers? I can address that if you'd like. So this is a waiver basically to allow schools to submit under the school-wide program rather than the targeted assistance program. Uh, okay. So the threshold for the school-wide program is 40%. Yeah. Some of our schools, based on last year's lunch applications, fell below that. They are allowed to continue in the Title I program for one additional year, and it just allows them to submit under that school-wide designation rather than the targeted assistance, really Perfect. allowing all students to access um, the Title I funds at That's those great. school sites. That's great. Thank you. I also have a quick question um, on 12.4. Uh, uh, school plans for student achievement. I'm wondering if these are going to be made public or have they been made public on either our website or the individual school's website? I think that this information would be um, valuable as it would be accessible to yeah, parents. We have, um, previously, we have made schools, we call them their CIE plan, which is a spending plan available publicly. The SPSAs, the Single Plan for Student Achievement, is typically available by request. It's something that can be uploaded to the school website, but it's been available by request. The spending part of it, though, is uploaded each year um, to our budget documents page. Um, can we make those available? Would that be possible if we made those plans available? Can we do that on their individual school websites? Yeah. So there's an approval process for those. You approve all of the plans mm -hmm. with their approval. Once they're approved, yes, they can be made publicly available. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, in that case, um, Madam Secretary, will you take a roll call vote? We need a motion first. Move President. to approve consent we calendar A. We need a motion. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Now we'll do a roll call vote. Okay. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member um, Miller? Aye. And Member Otto? Aye. Thank you. That passes 5 0. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have consent calendar B. Um, Mr. Miller? Yes. I recuse myself from consent calendar B as I have a potential conflict of interest under government code sections 1090 and under 87100. SoCal Gas provides services to the Long Beach Unified School District and has in the last 12 months, barely the last 12 months, provided a donation to the nonprofit cor uh, corporation Ranchos Los Amigos Foundation, of which I am the CEO. Okay. Move to approve consent calendar B. Are you going to second that? Second. Uh, any further discussion? I do have a question. I do have a question on uh, consent calendar B. Um, well actually, on 14.1, I want to, um, I'd like to propose that uh, in the future, when we're voting on policies, okay. before we do that, that we hear from the community and, uh, and then bring that policy or policies like the following uh, meeting to a vote before we vote on them here. So I just wanted to-, to Well, actually we're on consent calendar B, which is 13.1. Okay, so then I, I've moved ahead of the game. I'm like in the new business. Okay, uh, let's see. So Madam Secretary. Okay, thank you. Member Benitez. Uh, just to be clear, we're voting on consent calendar B, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, I vote aye. Um, President Craighead? Aye. 
Member Mil uh, Lopez. I want to be clear, consent uh, uh, calendar, calendar B, B the, the approval of finance. Okay, aye. And Member Otto. Aye. Okay, that passes 4-0 with one abstention. Okay, uh, now we're at new business 14.1, approval of board policy 3551, food service operations cafeteria fund, revisions to board policy 4030, non-discrimination in employment, and revisions to board policy 6159.2, non-public, non-sectarian school and agency services for special education. Do we have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Uh, discussion. Ms. Lopez? Again, for me, um, as I see that uh, we're moving to adopt three to five policies per board meeting, uh, I just, I, my comment here is that uh, I want to propose that uh, we hear from the public regarding policy or policies a, uh, a meeting before we, we vote on them. Well, some of the policies have to do with um, government regulations or um, up updated um, state regulations. And in those cases, we don't really have a choice on, on what we're doing. And so um, I suppose we can, uh, I don't know, Dr. Baker, do you have thoughts on, on <laughs> on how we do that as a... So there are, there are two board representatives on the policy committee that's doing a read and a, um, the month before they're coming to the board as part of their responsibility. I'm seeing that as the opportunity for board members to think about the public good in the approval of policies. And as President Craig had said, most of these policies are legally driven. They are updated based on the requirements of a school district, changes in ed code, changes in the law. And so if there are policies, perhaps you could consider policies that have more opportunities for community input that they, that they go to the community. Most of these um, are not really something that the community would probably want to spend time weighing in on. All right, I do, th I do believe that there are some policies. Um, I, I completely agree. Anything that uh, requires that we include Ed Cole laws, absolutely agree, but we do have some policies that I think uh, we can get input from, from the public. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, just a point of clarification. So, Ms. Lopez, if, just so that I'm, I'm clear on your, what your suggestion is that we would have the policies and not take action on them until the following meeting? So, what we, what we received was that at um, beginning in September 2023, the Board of Education will adopt three to five policies per regular board meeting, right? So obviously to ensure that we're in compliance um, with state and federal laws, right? But if we do have policies uh, where we can get input from the community, I'd like for us to hear out the community and then the following meeting we take it uh, to a vote versus getting the policy and voting on that policy that we, we receive it. And that would apply to the food service policy 4.1? No, I'm not talking about what we're voting on today. I'm just saying future policies. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I actually have kind of a clarification um, on uh, board policy 3551, would it be possible for us to add or to clarify what CFR is? I know that um, sometimes when we have, um, and maybe um, Viva, if you wouldn't mind coming to the podium, um, because sometimes our policies have all these acronyms. Sometimes they're explained or spelled out and sometimes they're not. Is there any way, and or maybe this is a legal question, can we make those additions and still vote on that policy tonight? Yes, you can make an amendment as long as you do it on the record, and then you can vote to approve. So if you, for instance, okay. on 
3551, uh -huh. if you're asking just to change CFR to Code of Federal Regulations, you may, you make that motion that you would like to approve the three policies uh, with the amendment to 3551 to read that. Okay. Um, at, at least if it's mentioned one time, there would be a reference point in the text. Yeah, I think go going, going forward, we'll make sure to do that, that on any, okay. any policy, the first time uh, a, you know, a, a code is used or any kind of initials are used, okay. we'll make sure to spell those out. And, and then the in the next, um, next policy we have listed, um, 4030, there's a uh, acronym CCR that if it could just be spelled out one time, that would be helpful. Viva, it seems like that was a legal question, so yep. thank you for being prepared to address <laughs> that, but I think we've got it worked out. Yep. So is there anything else we need to add to the motion, or does the motion stand um, as stated? I think you can go ahead and make a motion to approve 14.1 with the changes noted to 3551 and 4030 that you discussed with Ms. Bogey. Okay. Um, let's see. So would that be the um, board member who made the original motion? Can they uh, have a friendly amendment on that? Y yes. Did we make a motion? Yes. I'm sorry. We oh, yeah. that's right. We made a motion. Um, I want to revisit. So I'll remake the motion if we can revisit a discussion on the motion. Yes. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll accept the amendment, remake the, mo the motion with uh, President Craighead's um, additional language. Okay, and sen do we have the original second? No, with an amended we need motion, a, we need a, a new, new second. second. We need a new second. Second, and that's just to open discussion, correct? Yes. yes. Second. Okay. Dr. Benitez. Yeah, so uh, I want to go back to Member Lopez's um, question and then Dr. Baker's um, um, information that she shared about reviewing policies. Um, as I understand it, uh, our legal and our policy uh, expert were going to, uh, we had questions. Uh, President Craighead and I had questions about what that process would entail. Um, I do think that it would be beneficial for the entire board to, if we're going to, if we're going to be receiving, you know, X number of policies at a time, um, because I don't want to get caught up in uh, potentially board members seeing things for the first time with considerable revisions and or recommendations, and we don't really have practically a, a lot of time to process, synthesize, ask questions. So I would ask legal and re remind me of your new title, Viva, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I'd actually recommend that if we could put that on a future agenda as a discussion item so that it doesn't just stay in committee. Uh, right now, I'd, I'd, and or figure out a process where we get some input from uh, the entire board on what process would work best, um, given that there were there were several questions, Wayne. I'm, you know, I'm not remembering all of them. Uh, one on the quote unquote committee format and structure, but two on the process uh, that we were going to use to roll out multiple policies at a time. Um, we were going to provide sort of a rationale as to why certain policies needed to be rolled out first. Uh, why other policies, sort of what our rationale was for multiple policies. So I want to be able to revisit that. Uh, perhaps not right now at this time, but, but I do think we need to figure out what, what process would work best so that we're not on an ongoing basis, you know, digging deep into policies. Part of this was that some of these are more time sensitive than others. So a memo, uh, uh, Mr. Strump, for something that would guide our conversation and that we would, my suggestion, Madam Chair, is that we put this uh, as an agenda item so we can have a, a, a collective board discussion on what would work best for us since so many policies are going to be coming down the pipeline. Some, something that might um, address both of the suggestions is to do a first read that's not for action. It's just once yeah. the 
for the policy draft has come yeah. through legal and all of its other channels that it just gets on the agenda yeah. for first read with no action then there yeah. can be that would that would accommodate both of yeah. the suggestions so as an information item mm -hmm. yeah. it, mm -hmm. okay uh, but but I but I still think we need a discussion okay. on uh, the process uh, that we're using just so that we have a common understanding uh, as well yeah, and, and we can do that, I think, if we want to follow our board policies that we passed last year, you know, we just need a majority of the board to agree to that uh, uh, item for the upcoming agenda. So I, I would suggest that we finish voting on this item, and then if you'd like to make a motion on the... Uh, or I can do it in my board report, or, but yeah, let's, let's, yeah we're, we're on this item right now, so I agree with you, Madam Chair. Okay. And so, any further discussion, uh, <coughs> Madam Secretary? Thank you. Ready. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Member Miller? Aye. And Member Otto? Aye. That passes 5 0. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Um, next. In new business, 14.2, approval of the 2022-23 unaudited actuals. And uh, I think we'll go to sure, you. Sure, I can introduce the item. Sure, this is um, our final fiscal report for 22-23. Uh, we've closed the books and analyzed our revenues and expenditures for the final time for that fiscal year. Um, for the unrestricted general fund, our revenues were higher by approximately 12 million, um, largely due to interest income. Our expenditures were also higher by about $3.6 million, um, largely due to capital projects that occurred um, actually early, or than anticipated. Um, for a net positive increase to the ending balance of 8.1 million dollars. Um, we note that our revenues incorporate a continuing enrollment decline of 2.6 um, percent and attendance of approximately 90.5 percent that has not um, uh, increased to what our historical norm had been pre-pandemic. Um, we also note uh, for 22, um, 23, 20, for um, the expiration of one-time funding after this fiscal year. So this year will be very important in terms of establishing a bu budget fiscal uh, stabilization plan, as well as setting our priority investments to be continued. So if there are any questions on the actual report, Renee and I are ha be happy to answer them. Uh, do we have any questions? Dr. Benitez. Ms. Arcus, um, if you could just walk us through, I just had a, a um, I wasn't as clear on the art, music, and instructional related block grants, mm -hmm. sort of, if you could just walk yes. us through how, where that, how that reduction worked and. Sure, I'd yeah. be happy to. There's yeah. actually two. There's the art, music, and instructional materials block mm -hmm. grant and the learning uh, recovery yes. emergency block grant. Yes. So those two block grants, when we went into our budget time, were slated to one was about 40 million slated to be cut to about 20 million and the other one was about 96 million slated to be cut to about 66 million um, the good news going into closing our books and getting uh, the 45 day revised information was that we were able to close our books um, with less of a reduction meaning the um, uh, the art music uh, block grant was only cut two million dollars and the learning recovery uh, block grant was cut about, I think, $7 million. And so what that does as we close our books is we're able to recognize that that revenue is still in there and it comes forward into our next year. So our restricted ending balance um, was increased by about $42 million and that's reflective of having those funds available. As a district, we have not started utilizing those mm -hmm. funds okay. and so that Thinking that we may yeah. be cut by 50 million was a very strategic plan in order to do that. And now we are hopeful that that is the last to be brought up about those and we can use those as we develop further strategies. And, and for further conversation, Dr. Baker, if we could get uh, briefed at some point as to, because I know we were being very intentional and methodical in planning for 
uh, this new pot of money. Uh, I, I think it was Prop 28 uh, money and you know, just sort of our, our, our broader thinking on arts and music and what Ms. Ark has just reviewed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just, just to clarify that arts music, um, that's a, that's a, that was a one-time block grant that was granted and the Prop 28 is an ongoing appropriation. So just to be clear. Uh, but but uh, but I we did we were um, developing a comprehensive plan uh, right for Prop Twenty Eight for yeah yes. certainly for Prop Twenty Eight yes but the uh, arts music um, block grant has a very wide yeah. um, usage yeah yes thank you oh. okay do we have any other uh, discussion on the unaudited actuals. In that case, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we need a motion. <coughs> Move to approve. You want to second that since yeah. you're. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Madam Secretary, we're thank ready you. for a vote. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. And Member Otto? Aye. That passes 5 0. Thank you. Uh, next, we have 14.3, approval of resolution 090623-A, adopting the initial study and mitigated negative declaration for the Lakewood High School Aquatic Center project. Do we have a motion? Yeah, if we need him. Do we have a motion? Move for approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? And and yes, Mr. Miranda is here if we need him, if if we have questions. Do we have questions? Yeah, I I, I actually just want to make a comment, and that is that um, uh, because this is an initial study and a mitigated negative declaration, um, I don't see any problem with what it is that we're trying to do. The questions that were raised previously about the Wilson pool. Um, didn't go to the mitigated dec negative declaration uh, at all. And in fact, um, I, I haven't, and there was a robust response to that. I've had no one contact me with regard to this, uh, this pool. And, and to my understanding, there, there are no issues with regard to it, so I'm supportive. Did you have any questions no. for Mr. Miranda? No? Okay, any other discussion? No. Um, in that case, Madam Secretary, we're, we're ready for the vote. Thank you. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. And Member Otto? Aye. Thank you, that passes 5-0. Thank you. Um, item 14.4, approval of district response to the Los Angeles County Grand Jury Report, Career Technical Education Pathway, the road less traveled. Yeah. We have a motion. I move to approve. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, quick. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to apologize that um, I, I'm going to abstain from this because all we got on this was the recommendations um, from the school district, um, but the report wasn't provided. And when I, when I got my agenda and then the only day that I possibly could have found it was yesterday because I was, uh, because, because of the Labor Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And what we're being asked to do is to approve responses to a report that I haven't seen. And I don't know what's in that report besides what we're, what's being pro proffered to us as these are the comments that we would like to make. And um, ordinarily what I would have done was to go and get that uh, report so I could read it and develop my own opinion on it. But I just, because of the Labor Day weekend and other things didn't have time to do that, I don't suspect that there are problems, but having not reviewed it on my own, I don't feel comfortable supporting it. Okay. Um, Mr. Strumpfer, would you like to give us some background on this item? 
Sure. The, the grand jury did a report on CTE uh, within the whole county, including LAUSD, LACO, and, and Long Beach Unified. Uh, the report was, uh, in general, positive. Uh, they made some recommendations. Some of them were aimed at us and LAUSD. And they asked, under the law, we have to respond to their recommendations. So you'll see in the, in the report, and Mr. Otto, I appreciate your, your comment, and I, uh, in, in the future I will make all attempts to make sure that you have the report as well. But the, our response in the response actually includes each of the recommendations that they made to us and then our response to those recommendations. Uh, so that's what we have. Uh, and then you can see in, in most, if not all the recommendations, we are in fact uh, already following the recommendations or have already done the recommendations or plan to. Um, so that's the, that's the, the response we, we provided, the draft response we provided. I too would like um, to see the reports in the future before we, we vote on anything. Sure. I, I think a part of the reason that that didn't necessarily click with me was because this report was not critical. It was not. This was not one of those situations where we had to make responses that were uh, uh, questionable or were you know uh, hard hitting. This was a pretty soft report with just some basic recommendations on our program. Okay. Yeah. The the, the other comment that I would make is that. There are eight responses. It doesn't. We, I, I was unaware that that if these were the only all the responses that applied to Long Beach, um, and I, I certainly believe you when you tell me that. But um, uh, it's, it's such an important area. Career technical education is something that we uh, I think do an extremely good job on, and uh, we work hard on doing that. And it's very much uh, in the public eye these days. And uh, I wish that I had had a little bit more time personally uh, to, uh, to do it. And therefore, I, I'm not going to vote against it, but I'm, but I'm going to abstain from voting on it because I don't feel comfortable uh, saying that I'm, this is OK with me until, because I didn't have a chance to review it. That's all. We, we do have uh, time, uh, statutory time, to respond to it. To where I can we can bring it back in the next board meeting. I can send each of you the the report along with our response, <clears throat> and as long as we get it approved on the, at the twentieth board meeting at the twentieth, that'll be fine with our statutory requirement. So I'm I'm I, I happy like to that do idea. That. Thank yeah. you. Happy to do that. I would prefer that if it's okay. I don't want to create uh, additional work, but at the same time, I like I said, I I'm not against it. I just personally didn't have a chance to, to look at it. And, uh, but for the crazy schedule of yesterday and today, um, I, I think we were all here all day today. Um, I just didn't have a chance to, to, to look at it. That's all. Yeah. I, I, I can send, oh, I'm sorry. President. No, I think that's wonderful. I think that's <coughs> a great suggestion. I think we will um, pull this item for tonight, bring it back for the, uh, meeting on the 20th and then in the interim we will each be provided the original report yeah I, I can send it to each one of you via email tomorrow if you'd like that way you'd have a couple weeks to look at it happy to do that thank you okay in which case we will move to item 14.5 well we're not going to vote on it because we're going to wait for the report. Okay, I, I, I'm not against that at all. What I'm saying. Yeah. No, it just it just seems like that would be a good solution. We're it I, will be I, provided. The I report agree. I just wanted to make sure yep. that everybody agreed with that. Yes, because I believe so. Yeah, yeah. We're good, Doug. We're good. Okay. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry because we're good. I, no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> item fourteen point five. Approval of employment contract for chief technology officer. I need a motion. Uh, move for approval. And a second. Second. Great. Um, any discussion? Uh, Madam Secretary, we're ready for that vote. 
Yeah. Uh, Madam President, we do have to make it for the uh, statutory requirement. We do need to make a statement. I'll have Ms. Uh, yeah. Takahashi make it. that statement. Oh, okay. um, prior to the board's consideration of the recommended approval of the employment contract agreement for the chief technology officer and in alignment with government code section 54953C3, I'll announce the following summary of salary and fringe benefits set forth in the proposed chief technology officer employment agreement between Long Beach Unified School District and Jerome Jack Kalanick. Contract term is effective October 1st, 2023 through September 30th, 2025. Annual salary of $231,926.67, effective October 1st, 2023. Percentage salary increases will not be less than those granted by the governing board to any other non-represented manager or bargaining unit of the district during the term of this contract, including but not limited to any retroactive salary increase approved by the board for the 23-24 school year. Paid medical benefits on the same terms as other management employees. District paid life insurance with a death benefit of $50,000 and district paid premium for additional life insurance in an amount not to exceed $500,000, providing the annual cost does not exceed $3,250. 21.06 working days of annual vacation with pay exclusive of holidays. 13.26 days of sick leave annually and the district shall provide a monthly stipend of $350 for a vehicle allowance. And that. Those are the terms of the contract, the monetary terms of the contract. Thank you. And, and it's my understanding that um, this is technically a classified position and that in that process of having a uh, classified position that salary and everything else was researched and, um, and vetted and it's uh, a competitive salary that it wasn't just... Um, Yes, yes, the salary range was approved um, by the Personnel Commission after okay. our bidding Thank of you. comparable um, salaries. Do we have any further discussion? Okay. Are we adding another uh, position or are we replacing someone? The current Executive Director of Technology Services will be uh, retiring at the end of the month. So this will be a replacement of that position. Okay, then I believe we're ready for the vote. Madam Secretary. Thank you. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. And Member Otto? Aye. Thank you, that passes 5-0. Thank you, and I believe we, we have Mr. Kalanick here. So we'd like to welcome you aboard. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> And I just, I would just like to mention, we, we also approved our unaudited, unaudited actuals. And in that presentation, I was part of the uh, committee meeting this after, this morning. And one of the uh, focus areas for our external auditors is going to be cybersecurity. So you are coming on board at just the right time, I would like to mention, but the floor is yours. Yeah, no pressure. Keep yes, us safe. Evening. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, and Superintendent Baker. Uh, my name is Jack Kalanick, um, and yes, I am a little familiar in the cyberspace. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, welcoming me to Team Long Beach. I am very excited to be here and would be honored to, to join the team. Um, while I would be new to the organization, I'm not necessarily new to the work. Um, I do have over 20 years of experience in technology leadership in K-12 in other large urban districts, so I understand some of the challenges and opportunities uh, that we face. I believe that technology is a very powerful lever that can be used to boost student engagement, student achievement, as well as business efficiency and, to your point, um, improve security. Um, so I just wanted to say that I look forward to working with you all um, and to the superintendent, to the leadership team uh, in supporting the students of Long Beach. Thank you so much, and welcome aboard. Okay, next under new business, we have item 14.6, approval of superintendent contract renewal and terms. 
So prior to the board's consideration of the recommended approval for the amendment to the employment agreement for the superintendent, in alignment with SB 1436, which requires orally introducing actions on items impacting the annual compensation of executive staff, as we heard earlier, um, this agenda item involves the amendment of the agreement for the superintendent to extend the contract and all dates in the agreement by one year. The amendment does not increase the annual salary, salary schedule, or fringe benefits above the existing employment agreement. So we need a motion. Move for approval. Second. Uh, any discussion? Yes, I do have a question. So we are um, adding an additional year to the contract. So um, I guess my question is, why are we approving a contract um, for 2027? So it, it sounds like last year the board approved um, the extension of the contract to 2026. And I'm my question is why are we approving a contract to 2027 four years before um, personally i like to hear from our students our educators and our community before extending another year to the contract but maybe you can answer that question why so is it uh why we're doing four well four years were done but why we're adding another one to 2027 yeah, it's, it's a continued four-year contract. It was agreed last year to be a four-year contract. One year has gone by, so the, what the contract is is an additional year to continue to make it a four-year contract. Uh, and this is uh, typical with superintendents in, in major districts in California uh, for retention purposes. Uh, the contract still, of course, has uh, clauses about you know, wrongful conduct or even without wrongful conduct to release the superintendent. So there are options still available to the board members if, if there's any problems. Uh, but this is typically, you know, three, four, five year contracts is what you see for superintendents for retention purposes. So I guess to my colleagues, would it be possible for us to hear from our students, our educators and our community before extending that, uh, that additional year? Well, I, I think this is the work of the board. This, the, one of the main um, jobs of the board, one of the, one of the um, our, our main job duties is to oversee the superintendent. And so it's incumbent upon us to oversee her contract. And so I feel comfortable in the board making that decision in maintaining the fact that it's a four-year contract. And yes, we um, extended it last year, and I imagine we will extend it next year as well to maintain that status of a four-year contract. Um, generally, if you have a superintendent who's doing a good job, it's, it's just kind of a um, formality, and um, I, <laughs> I'd have to say I'm, I'm pretty happy with the job that our superintendent is doing. And I, I, I think this is one of, those, one of those items that might not lend itself to a collaboration with the community because this is the job of the board. This is, the, this is our role as board members. That's one of our main roles is to oversee the superintendent. Thank you for that. I, um, I Definitely agree. I understand that that is our job as board members, um, and in no way, shape, or form. And I am I uh, is this comment uh, meant to say that our superintendent isn't working hard and doing a great job? Um, for me personally, I would like to hear from our stakeholders before uh, extending another year. So. And and again, this just personally, I think that uh, there is value in. Uh, in taking input from our stakeholders? Well, I think as board members, we have the flexibility to um, make ourselves available, avail ourselves to the communities that elected us, the communities that we represent. And so um, if, you, if you would prefer to get um, feedback 
from your constituents, I think that's, you know, fine if you want to um, do that on your own. I don't see that as a um, a function of, of the board. I don't, I, don't, I don't see the board as a group, you know, doing that. But you're, but you're welcome to collect that information. Yeah. Do we have any other discussion? Uh, Mr. Miller? When I think about uh, the, the contract and the renewal of the contract, I think that it's important from our role and as we exude confidence to the, all of our community members that we show full confidence in our leadership. And I think that it not only shows that we are united as a team, as Jill is part of the larger team, but I think that that also speaks to continuity from a recruitment standpoint, when we're talking about bringing in other leadership, when we're talking about bringing in other staff, uh, to that, with my short tenure here on the board, Jill has only shown the strong leadership uh, that we've been looking for from a district, and so it gives me even more confidence to agree to the renewal of the contract, as I feel very confident and comfortable in the role that she's provided us thus far. Dr. Benitez. Yeah, I'm going to share a slightly different uh, perspective on the contract renewal and extension. So, uh, Dr. Bick, you started in 2020, mm. summer of 2020, right? <laughs> Under a very challenging uh, time. <laughs> All right. So, um, I, I do agree that if there were substantive changes to the contract, um, beyond you know changing of dates and there were you know a few other items um, I, I would be open to having a, a conversation amongst ourselves and the comment the comments that we receive in public comment um, you know folks could have showed up today the superintendent's contract was up on an agenda item um, and I would have loved to have that conversation but in actuality I don't think there are substantial changes to the contract nonetheless our duty is to hold our superintendent accountable. Mm -hmm. And for that, we have a performance evaluation that we do yearly. And if, in fact, we did not believe that our Dr. Baker's performance was up to the expectations, uh, then it would be appropriate to have that conversation. Uh, we just have it. We don't, we don't have any evaluation, performance evaluation, that would indicate that we would want to either review uh, or make changes to the contract uh, and or take any kind of action or corrective measure uh, on it. So truly, I uphold the same uh, belief that our duty is to represent our community and make sure that our um, commander in chief uh, is upholding uh, those community values. Uh, and we have a mechanism to do that, and that's her performance uh, evaluation. So if we did have concerns, uh, about the superintendent's performance, then it would be more than appropriate to have a conversation uh, about her uh, contract and or the extension of the contract. At this point, I, I'm not aware of any evidence uh, of that, so that, th those would be my comments. Mr. Otto. Yeah, and I, well, my concern is that we are moving towards a form of government whereby we get information ahead of time so that we can think about it and make comments. Um, we are in the middle, or we're, on, we're in the middle of a performance evaluation that we haven't done yet. Um, you know, we're getting information. Uh, we're going to meet. Uh, I, I should preface that by saying I'm uh, very, very happy with the performance of our uh, of our superintendent and how she's doing. But I think, I mean, what I was looking forward to was getting information, having a conversation, and then voting on this. I, I don't see any reason, I mean, I, we're just not doing it, and it doesn't seem to be, I mean, I, I got this on Friday um, to, and was told, and then I re reviewed it, had a chance to review it, and saw <laughs> that, um, no, there doesn't seem to be any substantive changes uh, in what it is. But I am, was looking forward to the uh, 
the work that we were doing with the superintendent to talk about what it was that was going on. I, I haven't had a chance to ask council whether if we delayed it till the next meeting or anything like that, whether there was anything wrong. My, my understanding of the contract is that uh, the contract is ongoing, um, and uh, I, I, was, I was waiting for the opportunity to do that evaluation. I thought it was going to be done earlier this summer, and then and then we kicked it over, and now, but we kind of kicked it over till today, um, but um, we we didn't have a chance because of the timing to do all that. But uh, I'm I'm more sensitive to communicating to everybody that I have no problems with performance. I have a little problem with process, and the process is that. We, uh, that we need to have information before we make votes on significant things. I, uh, you know, I felt the same way about the, uh, the technology uh, uh, position, uh, which when I got it said, approve this. We didn't have anything, I mean, we approved things before, but, uh, and, then, and then on this uh, grand jury report, it was the same thing, there was no report. I, it's been a bad habit, I think, of, uh, probably other districts as well as ours, but when you ask me to approve something, I like to see it and then approve it, not do it after the fact on a vote of, uh, you know, this is going to be fine. So I would prefer to, uh, uh, to, to wait a meeting before we did this, um, but, uh, but on the promise that, you know, before then we'll have a chance to talk. And uh, uh, otherwise, we lose that opportunity when it goes into a four-wheel drift. So, The decision about whether you take a vote or not tonight is inconsequential to the contract itself. I just want to make one comment that the delay in completing the formal evaluation process that actually has um, substance in almost all of the board meetings, there's a there's an aspect of my evaluation, was to accommodate board member schedules. So I just want to be clear, since we're talking about it in public, why there was any delay in not meeting what actually the board decided by contract, I have my evaluation by June 30th, but the board actually decided because of board member schedules to delay the completion of that process until this time. Yeah, and so. I think it's very important to make that point and I uh, was if not completely unavailable attending meetings on zoom so uh, I thought that's fine with me uh, as long as there was a chance to to do it and, uh, and but I want to be clear and with, with counsel uh, there is, there is no uh, legal consequence to, to, that we have to do it tonight no, there, there's no legal consequence. Right now, process-wise, you've got a motion and a second to approve, so we need to complete that motion or, you know, we can withdraw that motion if the majority of the board wants to do that. But, but there's no, but there's no, uh, no legal reason why it, it can't be continued. It's just at this point we have a motion and a second, so it's part of the process. We, we spent two and a half hours today trying to move into a new form of governance, not completely, but taking the first steps to do that. And the hallmark of that way of doing business, I think, is that the board becomes more involved in, uh, in, in, how, uh, in how, the, how the district is run. They have opportunities to be in conversation about what's going on, and, uh, and I support that. I mean, I think we all support that. We all said, let's go with this. Let's get this consultant in from the Council of Great City Schools and work on this. And that's been delayed a lot too, not through anybody's fault at the district or any place else, but I'm, I, I had hoped that that process would move more quickly. Um, it's, uh, everybody's incredibly busy. I mean, I, I, I mean in, in the district, uh, in the personal lives of the, the, uh, the board members, uh, and all I'm saying is, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I, I think we, if, uh, as uh, our consultant says, uh, it doesn't change until adult behaviors change. And the adult behaviors that we have on this board and, 
everywhere else um, doesn't put us in a position where what we're doing is working closely with the district. We're doing we're more in a approval mode than we are in a uh, in a in a deliberative working with the district mode, and that's what I think we're trying to move in the direction of. And uh, so I'm just trying to make that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Go ahead. Oh, so I was going to ask the quick question. So are you asking, Doug, that we uh, rescind the motion? Is that the proper oh, no, no, terminology? No. What is your request, Doug? I'm just curious. I would like to see it move to the next meeting so long as we would have an opportunity before then to, uh, to talk about uh, we're not uh, to, to, to complete the evaluation that we're in the process of. So question, legal question, Wayne. Is there any connection uh, between uh, the superintendent's evaluation cycle and this contract? There is not. There are two separate things. It, it's, it's convenient when they come together and you can do the evaluation. Uh, but my understanding is based on closed session agendas, that evaluation is kind of ongoing on a regular basis, yeah, right? right? Almost every meeting there's an evaluation. Um, so, but it's not, there's not a connection to completing an evaluation and improving, uh, approving a, a contract. Um, Ms. I, Lopez? Yeah, and I just want to point out, uh, it, it, it's perhaps uh, what uh, Mr. Otto just explained. I think a lot of the times for me personally, it's just getting things uh, towards the end, uh, right a few days before meeting starts and, um, and not having that time to, to look through the, through the information and engage, more importantly, in, um, in discussion with, with my colleagues. And I know I've brought this up uh, a few times, um, but that was a question that I had in terms of a contract being for four years and, you know, being in 2023, uh, just we're voting to extend it to 2027 from 2026 and, um, and I think that it would be a good idea perhaps to to move the vote to the next uh, meeting well in light of the fact that we have a motion on the floor and it has been seconded I say we take a vote on the motion that's on the floor and Can we continue the conversation madam chair we if we, yeah, if there's more conversation, yes. Uh, because I want clarity in, in, there's a difference to me in, in, in uh, needing opportunities to in, in discuss and engage with each other, which I think we're doing right now, mm -hmm. um, versus needing more time to be prepared to engage in that conversation. And so I'm not, I'm not sure if the request is, hey, we need more time to review the uh, revisions to the contract or to familiarize ourselves with the contract so that we can engage before we make a uh, before we take action or if if we are prepared but we want to continue this to another meeting to continue talking about this so I guess my question is for both Miss Lopez and Mr. Otto so okay. that then I can figure so out what, what today we received the feedback that we all gave right I like to read that feedback before we vote, I, um, so the feedback that everyone gave, um, I'd like to go through it, but. Um, feedback for what, Ms. Lopez? I, I think we need to be careful because we're talking about items in closed session, so we need to be careful. There, there are a couple of things um, that I'm concerned about right now. Um, one, I believe we had the information on Wednesday, and Letitia, maybe you can confirm this for me, but was that in our packet on, on last Wednesday? The no, I believe the contract you received on Friday. So, so we received the contract on Friday. Okay, in that case, the only changes to the contract were amendments in the date and the salary schedule. Um, and so those are the only changes. And so that's what we should be considering with this vote, not if we've had a chance to go over all the contract or if we've had a chance to go over the evaluations, but just the amendments in the date and the um, salary. The, the change in the contract is just dates. It just extends at one year. So all the dates were moved 
out one year and any, for instance, an evaluation to be done at a certain time, if it was given a year, it was moved back. So everything was just shifted back to make it a four-year contract. That's the only change in the contract. Right. So are you, are you okay with the fact that all we want to do is extend it a year? No, I, look, my, it, it's a process question. It's the way we do business. It's how, how we are involved in this. And, you know, I, I, we had an off-the-record conversation where you said, no, we got it on Wednesday. My recollection was we got it and on Friday. I've been corrected. I've been corrected. Our secretary has told I, me it's Friday. I've been corrected. Uh, I, I apologize. I'm not trying to, to hoist you on something. What I'm saying is we got it on Friday. Um, I reviewed it. I don't see any substantive changes in it except for what it represents. And that is this is not the way that we're supposed to be moving in the direction of doing business. We're supposed to get things at least a week in advance. Uh, something as important as the contract of the superintendent, we ought to get a week in advance, even if there's no changes in it, because that's what we say we're supposed to do. And since there are, in my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, no legal consequences if we put it over for two weeks and it would give us a chance to read the stuff that we got today uh, or, 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 or think about it even as, as a group, um, I don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, I've tried to declare my intent, my, my feelings about the work of the superintendent, and um, I think it's important how we do business. And, um, and we've said the way we're going to do business is by uh, taking a step back and then trying to work on this all together. And I don't see that we've made much progress in that in the last two years since we did that. It was, was it two years ago? Uh, Dr. Benitez, when we when we worked hard to come up with three years ago, I believe it was in the fall, and I believe we were at Browning High School when we did our uh, when we used the tool to assess um, our shared governance. And what did um, we come up with? Uh, I think um, don't quote me on this, but my recollection is that we all said that we were not at a level that we wanted to re be around our student outcomes focused governance and we all gave each other low scores using that tool and didn't we talk about um the ways that we wanted to do things with regard to receiving materials and, and things like that correct and that's why i and wanted to cl clarify mr otto if if indeed this conversation i wasn't sure if we on what basis we wanted to have a conversation if this conversation is about us getting materials seven days in advance. Um, you and I, Mr. Otto, worked on and proposed the policy that now has us materials seven days in advance. So if, if we want to um, pull this item, and I'm, I, if I made the motion, I'm willing to retract uh, it, based on us not having materials seven days in advance, uh, then really uh, we want to be able to uphold that we want material seven days in advance. However, if we want to have a substantive conversation about um, the superintendent's contract, I thought we were having that right now. Uh, you know, if we wanted to have a conversation about extending her contract a year, I thought we could have that right now. But that's a different conversation for me uh, than it would be to, for me to retract my motion. I don't even know what the appropriate Robert Rules uh, of order is on that. Withdraw. Withdraw, I'm sorry, uh, my motion. Uh, because of the process that you eloquently spoke to, uh, Mr. Otto, which is we should get material seven days in advance. And if that's the reason why uh, that we want to continue this to another meeting, I'm happy to withdraw my motion. I, and I'm not, I, I do not want to make a motion to continue it. I'd like to see consensus, but if we don't have consensus, then I don't need to do it. But I'm just saying from my own position is the way we're doing business is not the way that we decided, what, three years ago, that we should be doing business, which was, I mean, the original discussion was, let's get things two weeks in advance. Um, we've been working on how to do better, and we not only haven't done better, I don't think uh, we're doing as good as we used to do uh, since, since I've been on the board. And um, I think for 
good decision making that that's what we should do. And since there's a, no down, downside risk, I'm raising these points, but uh, I think the most important thing that this board and frankly any board can do is to come together. And if we can't come together on stuff like this, we're not gonna come together on other things as well. I will reiterate that I have no problems with, in fact, I'm uh, awestruck at how, with the great job that our superintendent is doing, but we made a decision to change the way that we as a board do things, and I think that as long as we keep saying, okay, five days with two days in the middle of it that don't really count because they're, big, they're uh, uh, holidays, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. There's got to be a point where you say, you know what, if we're not going to do this, then let's just say it, um, or we're going we're gonna to abide by it. I'm sorry it comes up right at this moment because of what it looks like, but it doesn't mean anything substantively. Let's just make a commitment. So, But, but unless everybody wants to do that, um, I'll just... We can just proceed. So, Dr. Benitez, that would come down to you withdrawing your motion. I would, I, I would urge, if I decide to withdraw my motion, I would urge my colleagues to hold the same standard on receiving items seven days in advance um, on all items moving forward, that we don't pick and choose um, which items we're going to hold up agenda items for and meetings for and actions of that if we agreed that we have a policy that we get seven days in advance that every single time that we don't get something seven days in advance that we engage in the same conversation so if we are willing to uphold that we have a policy whether it's presentations whether it's documents whether it's informational items that if an item appears on an agenda but the reason that we chose that Mr. Otto was so that it would give us time to revise agendas, if necessary, within the 72 hours uh, that we have. So I would just you know, ask my colleagues to think about that, to reflect on that, because if that's how we're gonna move forward, uh, then we need to be consistent uh, with which items we're pulling, which items we're going to abstain on, which items we're reconsidering uh, motions on, uh, and that we're consistent and that we do that every time that we don't get something seven days in advance uh, by process. Can I, can I add to that? And that is what I've noticed in my year plus here is that we try to get as much as we can to the board on Wednesday. <clears throat> Things happen, kind of the nature of the beast of a school district. Things happen Wednesday, Thursday to Friday. And what I've seen happen are settlement agreements that need to be that need to go in front of the board that are settled. Uh, Mr. Zaid has come to me on Thursday afternoon or Friday morning and said, "Can we get this on the on the agenda by Wednesday?" And we can because of the Brown Act. We post on Friday afternoon. We can actually post on Sunday if we wanted to. We, we post on Friday afternoon. So we actually post five days in advance and and provide. Uh, materials five days in advance. It also can happen with uh, litigation and certain certain issues come up that they come up on Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, or early Friday that that change. And so it, it, it could be, I just wanted to point out the problematic aspect of saying, hey, if we don't get it by Wednesday, we're not going to vote on it. It could cause operational problems with the district. Fridays even sometimes difficult. Uh, there are times where, where Mr. Zaid has come to me, you know, on Friday at five o'clock and it's like, oh, the, it's already been posted or, you know, we can try to change it. So it's, it's difficult enough uh, with school district business. Uh, but I think what I've seen is we make every attempt to get as much as we can to you by Wednesday. And then what we can't get to you by Wednesday, we get to you by Friday. And I do agree that's a little confusing sometimes. I think it gives you two different packages and it's, you know, it, I think it can be problematic, but to say that you're not gonna vote on anything that you don't get by a week ahead of time could be problematic for the operations of the district. And, and Wayne, I'm assuming that other entities, including other school districts, face the same challenge because I know for a fact that other districts uh, request to receive materials two weeks in advance. And so our seven days was, you know, what's viable 
uh, for a district our size, but also understanding that there are things that may come down the pipeline that we can't, uh, for obvious reasons that you just uh, shared, uh, do that for my, my um, my request of my colleagues is, is, and we have clarification that for this item, um, we're not bound legally to have to vote on this item today. You, you've brought up uh, examples of things that we're bound because of time, uh, right, to do. Um, I just wanna make sure that we adhere because we're loosey-goosey colleagues, let's, let's, let's be honest. Uh, we get stuff all the time, sometimes three days in advance, sometimes six, sometimes seven, sometimes there's revisions. And so I don't want to get in the habit and I won't withdraw my motion unless we reach consensus that we're going to be consistent, uh, that we're not gonna arbitrarily, in this case, it's a big item, it's our superintendent's contract, uh, say I'm not gonna vote for this because I didn't get it seven days in advance. So unless we hear otherwise from our executive staff, from our legal team, from superintendent, that there was no way to get us an item seven days in advance, I think we fall into a very um, slippery slope uh, that we could all use at any given time when we don't have something seven days in advance. So I, I want us to be wary of that so that I consider, I'd like to hear from folks so that I consider whether I'm gonna withdraw my motion or not. Well, I will mention that, um, you know, because I've served on this board for, um, for many years, we used to meet on Tuesday evenings and the night was changed because city council also met on Tuesday evenings, and so we moved our board meetings to Wednesday. But in the days that our meetings were on Tuesday evenings, we would get our packets on Friday. And so we had the weekend to go over the materials. And so I'm in the habit of not having a lot of lead time and just being prepared in advance if i have a meeting on wednesday i know that i'll have the materials on friday and i have that weekend and then if i have questions of people i can reach out monday morning and have a couple of days to have my questions answered um, legally it's 72 hours that we post the agenda and make it public or whatever i know ideally it would be nice to have things a couple weeks in advance or a week in advance but I, 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 can't, I can't say that I will adhere to the um, procedure of if I don't get something seven days in advance, I'm going to abstain. I can't, I can't make that promise because if I, if I get something on a Friday, I, you know, we get the original package on Wednesday and then we get a, a subsequent package the you know, following Friday, I can't say, well, I'm not gonna vote on this because I didn't have it on Wednesday. Because for me and my own um, procedure, I know I have a whole weekend and a couple of days after to go over the material. So it's, to me, I understand the quick turnaround and I understand that it would be crippling the business of this district if we demanded things in a certain number of days, didn't have it, and then we don't vote. I think it would be crippling to the business that we do and I don't think it would serve a purpose other than convenience of board members. I don't believe convenience of board members should be the deciding factor. I think the business of the district should be the deciding factor, and that's where I stand. So I, I will not, um, I will not um, abstain from a vote if I don't have information. And I, I, I just want to make this point because I think that it's really important, and that is, it's not a question of convenience. Um, if we had a culture that said, "Sorry." You can't come on Friday and try and put something on the agenda because we have a way of doing things. And the way we're doing for it, it, the way we do things, has a real meaning for how we conduct the business of the district because it allows us to work better with our board. Um, uh, it's very difficult to, to get things on Friday and then hopefully you're not doing something on Monday professionally or otherwise that prevents you from doing things that it just gets jammed. I mean, I, 
I, this is not about um, you, you, uh, you, you're interrupting the business of the board. The business of the excuse me, the business of the district. The the way you set the business of the district is the way is by setting it. And if you set it 14 days ahead of time or 30 days ahead of time or seven days ahead of time, then you have to abide by that. And that's what management is. That's what how you kind of get things done. And um, and sorry, you can't do you, you If you've got a relationship with somebody that says we have to get this done and it can't be done, given the rules of the way things are done in the district, then it doesn't get done then. And what you do is you change the way you do things and the management and leadership allows that to happen. I am talking about something that's fundamentally different than the way that the district has done things before. And I think that three years ago, we talked about the need to change that and we agreed to do that and we haven't done it. And what we're disagreeing about, I think, is why. And the why is if we're going to work together in a different way than we have by, a, by, by giving the board more latitude to be a partner in the doing of things instead of uh, the way that it's been historically, which doesn't seem to me to have changed over time, then fine, let's do that. Now, I, I, we don't have a consensus. Diane has made that very clear. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, that's, a, that, that's something that, uh, uh, that what, the reason I said what I said was because without a consensus, uh, uh, we may be back to where we were uh, three years ago, or we may need to have some conversations about that. I have been uh, uh, a strong advocate of this board having opportunities as a board to discuss the way we do business, a generative discussion on a regular basis. We've had that a couple of times recently, but it's not part of the culture. And this I see not as a Waterloo, but as a moment when we can consider the way we do business and how we want to do business and how we, we, we want to do it. I, I'm so inspired by uh, the, the strategic planning process and what's gone into that and how people have come together to work together and heard the voices of students and everybody else that I'm looking for the same kind of culture for the way we do business here. And um, that's why I'm talking about this. But so I think this is good. I think we're doing exactly what you and I envisioned us doing, uh, Mr. Otto. I, I, and, and Unfortunately, Mr. Miller, Mr. Otto, and Ms. Lopez uh, were not here, Ms. Craighead. Um, so I'll remind folks, I was one of, if not the strongest proponent for getting materials earlier for all the reasons that my colleagues here are suggesting, uh, right? Um, and, it, and it was not so much that I didn't understand Mr. Strumford's point that, you know, some things just got to get done, time sensitive, that we couldn't anticipate. Uh, it was more around when we were getting five or six or seven presentations that there just was not enough time. And in fairness to our team, and, and you all know me here, team, uh, then we end up with Juan Benitez asking 100 questions and six-hour meetings, which we were joking about, uh, because there was no time then to process, digest, interact, come prepared, and we used this term earlier today, prioritize, what areas I was going to ask questions around. So the whole philosophy, uh, Mr. Otto, on, on getting materials earlier was so that we could come prepared and have an opportunity to make the best use of our time. Um, it wasn't uh, dismissing that there would be items that we just wouldn't have seven days. Uh, uh, but that, that's why I wanted clarity today, that if we're talking process, I am all about us upholding processes that we've decided on. And so on that basis, if we're talking process here, even, even if our president Craighead can't commit to it, uh, we need three votes uh, for stuff. So process wise, I will withdraw my motion, but really ask my colleagues, we don't arbitrarily decide when we're going to uphold process and policy. 
at our individual convenience and that we remind ourselves, as Dr. Baker did today, that the reason we pushed this forward was to accommodate board member schedules. That the reason we moved the performance evaluation forward was to accommodate board member schedules. And so if, if we are gonna hold ourselves to that standard, that it comes with an expectation that we will call each other out as a governance team when we're not abiding by things that, and I'm looking at all of us, we agree are important to us. And so process-wise, Mr. Otto, I'll, I'll withdraw uh, my motion because we didn't receive this item seven days uh, in advance, and it wasn't uh, because of a time uh, restriction uh, here. And legally, uh, we don't have to take action today, but I don't think it's a good precedent uh, for us. Okay. You could call for another motion, Madam Chair. I, I, I could, but there's no expectation that <clears throat> a vote would <clears throat> indicate a different outcome. So that, if you'd like me to, I, I could do that. Mm -hmm. I don't believe anybody would make that motion, but. No, okay. Okay, so I think we've, we've learned a lot tonight. Um, I believe we, um, we have set a standard. Um, I, 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 can, I, can, uh, I can meet you at the level of, if we're gonna vote on something that includes a report, we need to have the report. I mean, that's kind of a basic, you know, um, a basic point we can I'm, I'm we sorry can to cut you off. The, the vote wasn't on the report. It was on the responses, and the responses are in our packet. It was, it was not on the report. It's on the responses. And so to that, we could have voted on the responses. Yeah. Yeah, we could have. That's true. Um, so that concludes the new business part of the agenda, unless anybody has anything else. Madam President, can I just ask to confirm for the record that this item is going to be continued until September 20th board meeting? Yes. Is that the? Yes. So we are not voting on that item tonight. We will vote on that item September 20th. And, and Mr. Strumford, just for the record, so that we have time to review the item and discuss the item because the time w was not sufficient and did not abide by our seven day um, policy. Okay, so we will now be at report of board members. I'll start at this end with Ms. Lopez. Thank you. Um, so I had the opportunity to visit King Elementary School, Los Cerritos, Garfield, Muir, Lindbergh, Hughes, and Lindsay. And the faculty and staff at each and every one of these schools was just incredibly welcoming. Um, I'd like to thank Principal Orozco Benusi and uh, Principal Ramos for taking the time off um, their busy schedules to give me a tour of their school. I thoroughly enjoyed visiting the campuses. Um, they're beautiful and they're, they were so ready for the uh, start of the school year. Also to the teachers um, whom classrooms I had the opportunity to visit prior to the start of the school year. Uh, kudos to you all, your classrooms looked just amazing and um, it was clear that you were ready for the first day of school for your students. And uh, finally, um, to our returning students, to our new students, um, good luck this school year. Work hard, make new memories, and shine in the classroom. I'm sure you all do great. Thank you. Mr. Otto. Well, this may be the biggest 360 or 180 you've, uh, you've seen, but I actually came with presents for each of the board members in celebration of Labor Day because um, I think we, uh, it, it slips by, and so what I brought for uh, each of you is something that was, is personally important to me, and I'll explain that. It's a copy of a book called Rank and File. It's by, um, 
It's edited by Alice Lynn and Stoughton Lind. Um, uh, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But um, my, my goal was to, um, to inscribe these, but I didn't have any time today because I was busy getting ready for this uh, meeting. I also intend to give um, uh, copies of, of this to uh, Steve Rockenbach and um, um, Chris Calpe because I think we've had an incredible labor year. And uh, we- Do you want me to pass this down? Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and it's a reminder of where it is that we are. Uh, as a district, we've got labor peace, more or less, for a while now. It gives us more of a chance to work together and to figure out the best way to be the best that we possibly can be uh, for this district. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I thought about this earlier. Staunton Lind uh, died uh, late last year. Um, and. Uh, I've also included in the back just a quick Wikipedia thing about Staunton Lind, uh, who, who had died. He was a, f a famous, uh, um, first, uh, the, he was, first of all, he was the son of Robert uh, and Alice Merrill Lind, who were the authors of the Middletown studies about Muncie, Indiana, considered the classics in, in sociology and uh, and uh, then his father, Robert, taught at Columbia for a long time. Uh, and then when Stoughton uh, he went to Harvard, but then he went and worked at Spelman College for uh, a number of years and got his PhD at Columbia and um, uh, became a labor organizer and lived a life of uh, devoted to labor and did a, a lot of things. And there's a quick biography of him um, uh, as, a, as a legendary person in labor issues. And labor is so in the center of what it is that we do. Now, um, the, the reason it's important to me is because when I went to law school, Staunton Lind had been at Yale. Uh, he went to North Vietnam in 1969 and uh, therefore didn't get tenure and was, was asked to leave and he wound up in Chicago, and he wound up going to law school at the University of Chicago. Uh, although they, Philip Curlin, the constitutional law scholar, said that if they let him in, he would leave. Uh, and um, he, uh, uh, they, they let him in anyway. Uh, and Philip Curlin uh, didn't leave, but he became a labor law attorney down in the Mahoney Valley in Ohio with all that strife in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s. And um, uh, you'll, you'll see from the, the quick biography, uh, it's a, he, he was an incredible man. Um, the, um, uh, the book Rank and File is the story of labor organizers in the Midwest. And, uh, uh, and how they became involved in a meaningful way in the jobs that they had and made those jobs uh, really meaningful. I went to the, the labor parade and thing on Labor Day over in Wilmington that they, they have in, every year. And um, uh, it's the, to, to see the enthusiasm and the commitment of people was, was very meaningful. The reason that it's important to me and why I wanted to share it with my fellow members of the board and people involved in labor was because um, when, I, <coughs> excuse me, when I was in law school, uh, I lived with Staunton Lynn and his family for a year. We were very close and I learned so much from him uh, and his family that uh, it was a... Uh, uh, it was a very important part of what it is that I learned in Chicago and in law school. And so I hope this is the kind of book that you don't sit down and read cover to cover. It's the kind of book that you read a story about somebody's life and how it became meaningful and successful in a very mundane way. 
And uh, given the fact that it was Labor Day last weekend, uh, I just thought it was uh, a good way to say to my colleagues on this board and to the people that do labor for the district and in uh, against the district that, uh, that, that this is uh, part of our lives and what we do. So, so, uh, uh, so that's it. And I went to Garfield on uh, uh, the day that we all went back to school. That was very meaningful. Uh, and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, and thank you for the book, Dr. Benitez. Yes, thank you for the book, uh, Mr. Otto. I'm going to share this with my family. I come from a long line of iron workers and public employees, uh, union household. My dad was a 35-year iron worker member in, in San Diego, so the only reason that my family has a pension, that we had health benefits, um, that my sister and I were able to go to college was because of the stability and the uh, decent working conditions that my parents were able to have because of our um, organized labor uh, movement here in the United States. So thank you uh, for the book. Um, but I'm going to bring it back to business. So if I can get support here from one of my colleagues, uh, I would like for us to put an item, um, since some of these policies are time sensitive, on the next agenda. Uh, I think it's uh, September 20th, um, specifically around this inter-office correspondence that we received that lays out a process um, for us to uh, move on uh, some more urgently than these others, these pending revisions to policies, so that we have an opportunity to uh, discuss the process, get an understanding of it, provide some feedback. So if I can get um, support from my colleagues here. This is our process uh, that I can call for an agenda item, but I need another member. Second. So it's been moved and seconded that, I'm sorry, what, what, what was your uh, motion? That we place the inner office correspondence as an agenda item so that we can uh, provide, be provided an overview of our process for uh, revising and adopting uh, upcoming policies that we need to uh, revise. And yeah, in, in a different way, we're, we'll have a first reading. Yes. And then the next board meeting, we'll have a vote for policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is there any discussion on that? Madam Secretary, we'll have you take a roll call vote. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. And Member Otto? Aye. Okay, that passes 5 0. Thank you. Um, so I'll close uh, tonight just um, in gratitude for every single one of. Um, our LBUSD team that helped to get us started with this new school year. Um, every single uh, member of the team, uh, by all accounts, uh, played a major role in us having a successful uh, opening of a new school year. I also want to um, express gratitude for all the community members, um, parents, caregivers, family members, friends. Um, that played a role in getting those 65, almost 65,000 students uh, onto our schools. And it's no easy feat, uh, as I shared last time, to get a system as large as ours um, to be running on those well-oiled ball bearings uh, for a whole new academic year. So um, I'll share something personal. It was, it was just as tough to drop off someone in their first day of middle school as it was on their first day of kindergarten. And um, that drop off and pick up to me is an ongoing constant reminder of what parents, families, caregivers, community members, friends entrust us uh, with as a school district. Uh, and they entrust us with the most important things in their lives. Uh, and those students um, have their futures um, in alignment with everything that we want to do as a district and so I also am looking forward to this board 
adopting board goals that we started developing this morning ASAP so that we can get to the priorities uh, of our community around student success so that we can align with our district goals and with our superintendent goals and so that we can in the spirit of Mr. Otto's words uh, advance the district in a way that's more intentional more meaningful more purposeful for us as a board and until we adopt those goals um, then we're left with conversations like today that we reflect on but that we really don't have a mechanism to hold ourselves accountable to as a board and then we have these discussions us versus them discussions and I'm guilty of it as well uh, with our executive team um, rather than having these discussions amongst ourselves. Um, so I urge us uh, to move expeditiously to adopt those board goals so that we can continue to have these uh, engaging conversations and more importantly, continue to improve student outcomes uh, in our district. That's my report. Thank you, Mr. Miller. All right, uh, so I have a couple of things that I wanted to highlight. Uh, if graduation day is my favorite time of the year for the district, I would say my second favorite is back to school. And uh, as uh, celebrating the families and our students and teachers and counselors uh, on their return back to campus for a fun, exciting year, uh, I really enjoyed it. And so um, uh, this year in particular, uh, we had a really big kickoff over at Garfield. Uh, most of my colleagues were there with us. And uh, uh, I don't know about you all, but I had a whole lot of fun uh, um, kind of celebrating with those families. And so uh, if nothing else, I just wanted to give a big uh, thank you to all parties involved to make not only that first day of school, but uh, just the first couple of days here uh, a success for our students as I um, have a kinder who is truly enjoying herself, to say the least. And so um, uh, just a big kudos to everyone involved. Uh, to get to that point, uh, there was a number of folks uh, who hosted large community events uh, to support back to school. That is uh, just really one of those altruistic components of the city of Long Beach. We. Uh, we love hard as a city. And so uh, we have a number of really big cultural events and um, we love our children. Uh, and um, there were a number of programs centered around just uplifting families and youth uh, before the school year started. There was events hosted at Kings Park in my district. There was a really, really awesome event uh, hosted at uh, Shear Park, where uh, myself and Maria uh, were party hardy and with the, fo <laughs> with the folks uh, on um, over at Shear Park. As I said, uh, there was another back to school event over uh, at Lafayette. So I just want to give a big shout out to a couple of entities that hosted a number of back to school events. Obviously, I wanted to thank Councilmember Al Austin and his team for putting on such an awesome event. Uh, I wanted to thank Long Beach Forward for their great work. Uh, also, the folks over at Lafayette uh, for all they did for our students. And uh, last but not least, Cottonwood Church, who did a lot of the donating uh, for uh, Al Austin's event. So just wanted to thank them uh, for their support. Uh, last but definitely not least, a couple of days ago, we all got a, a nice extended three-day vacation with Labor Day, right? And so, uh, and we celebrate our champions in organized labor. And so I wanted to uh, just thank all of our labor partners for their great work. Uh, I got to participate in the parade as uh, was Doug, and I was uh, walking with a number of my friends, uh, particularly our folks in CSEA. <laughs> um, but it was a, a great moment, not necessarily uh, just centered around the employment components that is obviously linked to organized labor, uh, but the celebration of families getting the resources to continue to thrive. That's what I think about when I think about Labor Day. And so when we were at the park in Wilmington 
after a really long walk, let me tell you. I probably should have hopped in the bus like a lot of other people, but I missed out. Um, uh, all things considered, it was great being at the park and seeing uh, not just those folks in labor, but seeing the family, seeing the son, seeing the daughters, eating food, smiling, dancing, uh, enjoying uh, one another. Um, as we talked about earlier, uh, just a short three years ago, uh, we had lost all social interaction. And so to kind of be in that space, to um, that, this celebratory space, it was uh, uh, a joy, a joy to be a part of. And so... Um, Outside of that, uh, we got a new visitor sitting here. I wanted to welcome you, Kellyanne. I appreciate you uh, joining us today. I think today's meeting was a um, lot more talkative than most. No, I'm kidding. Now, uh, today we were uh, pretty fiery, but we were talking about some important conversations. I think that uh, from a principal standpoint, uh, one of the things that I have stood on as a um, as a man, is I try not to let uh, perfection get in the way of doing good work. Uh, and so earlier when we were having a discussion on uh, maybe not the timely receiving of something, uh, I know that there's items, uh, there's a lot of movement, a lot of activity that happens at the district. And so um, as we uh, think of how we perfect our systems, because I believe in the importance of having proper systems to make sure that we can execute the work uh, in an efficient manner. Um, I just recognize that when you're talking about 65,000 students, when you're talking about almost 10,000 plus employees, uh, and you're talking about the biggest variable we got, humans. That's a hard thing to do, man, seven days in advance, <laughs> but we'll try. And I know uh, uh, we've um, put out the um, expectation, and so we'll continue to try and get there. But uh, I got a little fiery at the end just because, uh, like I said, I don't like uh, perfection to get in the way of uh, good work. So anyway, thank you guys, and um, appreciate you guys being understanding. Thank you. What you did was you let your passion for the job and for the kids show. And I don't think you should apologize for that. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, first day of school. I, I can't. It's hard to remember a, a first day of school, an opening to school, a first week that went so smoothly. And I hope I didn't just jinx the whole deal by saying that, but it was so much fun at Garfield. And, and talk about um, uh, you know, putting all that um, inability to socialize behind us. We were out there uh, high-fiving, shaking hands, hugging. We were, it was just the most... Um, celebratory, warm, fun. We had our mayor, Rex Richardson, with us. Um, and not only uh, greeting the kids and the parents, you know, seeing the, seeing the boys with their fresh haircuts and, and all the new shoes, all clean. It was first day. I'm sure it was different the second day by then. But we had an opportunity to go into a kindergarten class with Mrs. Gines, she allowed us to come in and she did um, her best to make those little kinders feel comfortable and she did activities for them to, not just to get to know her, but to get to know each other. Um, it was really wonderful to see her um, in action. She has such a, a, a kind and, and uh, uh, tender spirit and then we went into a fourth grade class with Mrs. Van G. I would say her last name if I could. Um, it's very hard to pronounce anyhow and I've known her for a long time too so I just uh, still have not learned it. But her class had a discussion on a book uh, called The Circles All Around Us and it was about you know who's in your inner circle, who's in the circle you know, outside of that. And there was wonderful discussion about who we keep closest, who we let in. And um, in during the discussion, there was one fourth grader that said, um, where, where you are, 
doesn't matter as much as who you are. This was said by a fourth grader, and I thought, that should be embroidered on a pillow. That is very profound, um, but wonderful to spend time with the kids in the classrooms and I experience that first day excitement up close and personal. And then um, I, I got to spend a bonus day with Dr. Baker, and we um, visited three schools in the fifth district. We started out at um, Keller, and we saw the new locker room and dance studio that is not quite complete. It's almost completed, 90-something percent complete. Gorgeous, really nice. And it, it really kind of transform, transforms the campus from a former elementary school to looking more like a middle school campus. And they also have landscaping that's going in in the front. And that's I, I believe that's Measure Q. Um, stuff for the landscaping. Um, so <clears throat> very nice to go in and out of the classrooms at Keller and see what's going on over there. And then we went to Henry and um, watching the, we, we went into a, a TK class and so watching those little um, TK kids managing in Spanish <laughs> was very fun. And um, And then we ended the morning at McBride, um, which was uh, very enjoyable. We went in some classrooms. Some some of the classrooms they were they were doing um, you know getting acquainted activities, and and some were really jumping right into academic ac activities, and um, very fun to see all that. So for the new school year, I want to mention that our um, City of Long Beach Parks and Rec and Marine Department. Um, is offering af a free after-school program at select city parks, including their community learning hubs, mobile recess. Um, these programs are gonna run until December 22nd. It's an after-school like three to 6 p.m. So check that out um, to see if there's a park near you that you can take advantage of. Um, also, we talked about um, arts and Prop 28 funds. We are investing $10 million this year in music, art, dance, uh, due to Prop 28. These are programs that are gonna be sustainable. This is not grant money. This is money that will be sustainable. We've, um, I, I believe we had the presentation on our visual and performing arts last spring. Uh, so excited! So exciting that we are investing in the arts, um, as we should. And then also this year, um, upgraded IT, and now we have somebody that's going to be leading. I mean, somebody new who's going to be leading that, um, which is wonderful. And then you're going to see things like water stations on our school campuses, um, and it's not just the old-fashioned, you know, you lean your head over and get water. It's like bo uh, bottle filling stations, that kind of thing. So I believe we're moving our campuses into the new century with uh, new furniture throughout. Um, and as always, the most wonderful people in our classrooms. So thank you to all of the teachers um, for showing up and giving their best to our, our kids. And actually, not just the new teachers, but I mean, not new teachers, but not just the teachers, but all the staff that, that we rely on, Every, everybody, you know, from administrators to our school nutrition workers and um, custodians, everybody puts in so much of themselves to make sure that our, our kids are doing well. So thank you to everyone for a smooth opening of school. And so Dr. Baker. Thank you, I have no report tonight, thanks. Thank you, in which case that concludes our uh, meeting for this evening. Our next regular, regularly scheduled meeting is Wednesday, September 20th. Um, and so with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>